Welcome back, everybody, to Full Press Coverage Radio. This is the Full Press Coverage Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. This is episode five. I am your host, Parker Hurley. I am with, as always, my co-host, Brian Harker of LastWordOnProFootball.com. So uh, let's bring in Brian. How are you doing today, Brian? Oh, I'm doing good. Nice, beautiful morning. Steelers got another player, and uh, it's looking pretty good. Nice. Yeah, I woke up to like five inches of snow somehow. I have no idea how this happened. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a snow day today, and I'm going to you know, watch some uh, Morgan Burnett tape because that is what this podcast is going to be about. Um, we're going to discuss Morgan Burnett, uh, like Brian mentioned, the Steelers' most recent signing. Um, this is how the Steelers always do it. You know, They wait until the second wave of free agents. And then they kind of just steal these value cheap guys, you know, that are going to be impact players. They're probably going to make a little less than maybe they even would have would have anticipated. And the Steelers tend to pick those guys up. We saw it last week with John Bostic. Um, me and Brian have a podcast that you could definitely check out uh, at fullpresscoverage.com uh, where we talked about, you know, what Bostic brings, uh, what his ceiling is, what his limitations are. And we're just going to do the same for episode five with Morgan Burnett, um, 29-year-old safety Spent his entire career in Green Bay. Um, he's a guy that, you know, we're definitely going to talk about his versatility. Um, he's played free and strong safety. He's played linebacker. He's played cornerback. Um, he's been in the slot. He's pretty much done it all. Um, I, I think the big thing with Burnett that a lot of people are going to point to is, you know, um, I believe it's eight seasons and nine interceptions. He's really not a splash player, you know, uh, only eight force fumbles as well. So, you know, you're getting maybe one or two turnovers a season with Burnett. But he's also a guy that, you know, he's, like I said, versatile. He's been in the Packers uh, organization for about uh, almost 10 years now. So, you know, he's stuck in the NFL by knowing what he's doing and by being able to wear a lot of hats. So um, maybe not a splash signing, but, you know, like I said, nonetheless, still a value signing. Um, So overall, what were your immediate thoughts on Burnett? And then, you know, maybe if you got to watch him a little bit uh, yesterday, we're still in about a 28 to 24 to 48 hour window of the Burnett signing. But what are your original thoughts on the Burnett uh, signing? I was kind of shocked. I wasn't even aware he was a free agent unless uh, it was one of those deals where they let him go because they didn't refuse the pay cut. I'm assuming that's how it went, but I thought it was a, uh, I thought it was a typical bargain uh, pickup for the Steelers. Uh, you know, they've never been one to use free agency to make a splash. They use it to fill holes and find stop gaps that are uh, more than adequate, and they're always an upgrade as to what they previously had. And I think uh, Bennett is really uh, going to add leadership. He's going to add intelligence. And like you said, he ain't a splash playmaker, but he just does the job. And that's really all that they could ask for. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much hit it. Um, He actually was a free agent. Um, The safety free agent market has been really weird this year. Um, I think it has to do with Eric Reed because, you know, he's this 26-year-old former first-round pick free agent that, you know, should have a lot of demand, but um, he's in the center of that whole kneeling anthem thing. So I think the fact that he's arguably the top safety on the market has kind of pushed everyone down the safety market, whereas, you know, Maybe these guys are going to have to take a little bit less because he's going to have to take less, or he may not even play this year. You know, he may get the Kaepernick treatment, but I think that's what's going on in the safety market because every safety that is signed so far is coming well below market value, and Reed has still not been signed. So I think the Steelers kind of just said, you know, we're just going to sit back, we're going to take advantage of this market, you know, we're going to let it decline and decline, and then we'll kind of swoop in and get get our guy. And um, yeah, you absolutely talked about it. Um, the, the big thing that I kind of took away when you look at the details of the contract, you know, it was three years, $14.6 million. Um, when you look at Mike Mitchell was going to make about $5 million next year. So the Steelers kind of sat down and looked at, you know, kind of looked at the table and said, well, Mike Mitchell has one year left at $5 million. We could extend him, you know, for three years, $15 million, and he would absolutely do that. But we would rather pay 14.6 for Morgan Burnett. So they clearly... It, they're not just, you know, they didn't just make this move to say $400,000. There's That's just not how you do it. Um, they clearly see Burnett as an upgrade for Mike Mitchell. So they see themselves as, you know, we did shave $400,000 in salary, you know, over the next three years spread out. But in, in the overall, we're getting a better player and we're getting a better fit. And I think that you hit it in, in the terms of he's not a splash player, but he knows what the heck he's doing. And um, he's going to be a leader. And, you know, we talk about Mike Mitchell all the time. You know, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call Mike Mitchell a leader. You know, he's a very emotional player, and I like that he plays with emotion. But a lot of the time, his emotion kind of gets the best of him, and it takes him out of plays. And, I mean, we all still talk about that play against Leonard Fournette where Fournette had, like, an 11, 12-yard run, and Mike Mitchell is just like – he. it was a nice tackle, but it was a first-down run for Fournette, and it was like the Super Bowl for Mike Mitchell. And, you know, I don't usually have a problem with it, but – I think he get, he lets the emotion get the best of him sometimes, and all of a sudden he takes himself out of plays, whereas Morgan Burnett is never going to take himself out of plays. Um, another thing that I really like about Burnett is that he called plays for the Green Bay Packers last year, and uh, we talked about John Bostick called plays for the Colts last season, so it, it's, it's clear that this is what the Steelers are looking for. You look back to the draft last year, um, T.J. Watt, Joshua Dobbs, James Conner, um, Cameron Sutton, all of those players were team captains when they were drafted. You, you, you signed John Bostick and Morgan Burnett, you know, two guys who really actually did lead the defense in terms of alignment, play calling, you know, getting guys in place, everything like that. So it's clear that at some point the Steelers noticed that there's probably a locker room issue going on. You know, maybe there's too many personalities going on. And now they're starting to get their type of player and, you know, um, yeah, you look at Morgan Burnett and just his discipline and his understanding and his professionalism, and you compare that to a guy like Mike Mitchell, and you could say, you know, it may not even be much of a field thing, you know, what's on the field, but it, it's just such a huge locker room impact. And, I mean, he is. He doesn't make mistakes very often. He's not going to make splash plays, but he doesn't make mistakes. But when you add in that the locker room and just the ripple effect of, you know, him teaching a guy like Sean Davis, whereas, you know, maybe Mike Mitchell cannot resonate to him because Mitchell's such an emotional type of person. Um, so that's really the off of the field. Um, unless you want to touch on anything else off of the field, we could get into, you know, what he's going to bring on the field. Um, what do you see? We'll start with the pass, uh, um, his play against the pass, because, you know, being a safety, that's where he'll be most important, even if he is a strong safety who's played, you know, some linebacker in the box situations like that. Um, how do you see him in the past? Who do you want to see him defending? Um, do you think he's a zone or a man guy? What do you think overall about just Morgan Burnett, the pass defender? As a pass defender, he seems to be better in zone, but he's not that bad in man. Uh, and like you say, he's, he doesn't have, he's not the fastest guy on the field, but his technique is, is above board. So he's always in the right position to make a play. You know, like you said, how many times, could Mike Mitchell have been in position to make a play, but his emotions took him out of it? Uh, he's more worried about making the big hit than turning his head around and catching a football. And that's one thing that uh, Bennett brings is that leadership. And he's got the Super Bowl ring, you know. So Ben's not the only player on the team with one now, you know. And it's something that the other the other defenders in the backfield can look to, and he can tell them, hey, this is how you do it. You know, you got to put yourself, uh, put the team first, worry about your stats later, do what you're supposed to do, and, and everything will take care of itself. And I like the fact that uh, he appears to be quite adept at covering tight ends, which is what we've been sorely lacking for four or five years now. Yeah, I think that's the absolute nail on the head. Um, just to touch, you know, to finish up the off of the field, I agree with what you were saying um, about the Super Bowl ring. And I mean, I think that, like I said, I think that can resonate to Sean Davis more than a guy like Mike Mitchell can. And I think playing multiple positions could resonate to Sean Davis more than Mike Mitchell can, whereas Morgan Burnett can say, you know, Sean Davis's first, what, you know, five or six weeks of his career were in the slot. It didn't go well. He finished his rookie year at strong safety. But, you know, only spent one offseason at strong safety before. It looks like he's going to have to move positions again. So, you know, Burnett, a guy who's played strong, free, like I said, he plays the linebacker role at times, you know. Burnett can look at Sean Davis and tell him, you know, hey, man, I made it nine years in the NFL. You know, I'm doing this, this, and this. I want a Super Bowl ring because I was so versatile in what I was able to do. You know, this is how you can do it, Sean. So um, I do like that that impact as well. Um, yeah, like you said, as for coverage, um, Definitely better in zone than man, in my opinion. Um, and it comes back to, like you said, the smarts and just the understanding of, you know, where he has to be. He never really leaves his zone. He knows how to pass off defenders and, you know, stay stay disciplined to where he's supposed to supposed to be. Um, and man, like you said, uh, he's really not bad. Um, he's, he's actually pretty strong, and it comes down to his technique and his foot quickness. Um, and uh, he shut down bigger receivers, faster, uh, faster running backs. But yeah, I think that's the that's the big takeaway is that um, 
team, the Packers almost solely just kind of said, you know, if it's Jimmy Graham or if it's, you know, whoever, um, there was a play where Julio Jones was lined up in the slot and, you know, they just threw Burnett on and really any big wide receiver that they could get in the slot or just, you know, that really wasn't on the outside, you throw Burnett on him because um, he's so quick footed. He's, he, he's understanding. There was a play that I'm going to highlight on fullpresscoverage.com that you guys can check out an article I wrote about Morgan Burnett. It's just highlighting the versatility of Burnett, but there's a play where he takes on Julio Jones and um, you can just see that he understands where the route's going and he's taking away the middle and he's forcing Jones to the sideline, but he also knows he's forcing Jones to the sideline. So he uses that understanding and his foot quickness to also break on the ball to the sideline. And he, uh, he ended up batting it away. You know, it was a very aware play in man coverage against Julio Jones. I mean, that's as good as, that's as good as you want it to be. You know, he's defending the top dogs and um, you know, the Steelers, Everybody talked about Sean Davis versus Rob Gronkowski. You know, that is just, it was really one of the, you know, most important drives of the entire NFL season was, you know, the Patriots were trailing, home field advantage was on the line. Rob Gronkowski just took Sean Davis's soul and really, you know, game winning touchdown. Um, And, you know, um, Morgan Burnett will be the guy guarding Rob, Rob Gronkowski now. You know, I talked about how Bostic can do it and you can bracket him maybe with Burnett and Bostic, maybe you just sign two guys who you want to try and throw at him. But um, that's going to be the guy. And, you know, he's he's not the fastest guy, especially when it comes to long speed, but he's he's quick enough to where he can – little flares and screens to running backs he's completely fine on. When you get to wheel routes down the field or if you line him up outside down the field, there may be an issue. But overall, I think he's really strong in coverage. Um, is there anything else you want to touch on in coverage or do you want to get to the running game because – I think the running game is interesting due to the, how often he's in the box. Due to, um, like I said, last season he ended up playing 34% of his snaps as a fifth defensive back or as an extra linebacker. He would technically be the second linebacker um, in a nickel situation. So, I mean, this is a guy that's going to have to stick his head in. At least he did stick his head in last season. So, um, how do you see him against the run? And uh, where do you think he lines up best against the run? Well, first of all, the thing that caught my eye is that I had to watch some of his highlights, and I had to do a double take on quite a few of them because when he tackles, he actually tackles. He wraps up <laughs> and he holds on, you know? It's like, what is that, and form? Even, <laughs> exactly. I haven't seen that since, what, Mel Blunt maybe? Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, if, he, if he's sitting up there in, in the middle of the field up, up behind the linebackers, uh He's got plenty of speed to cover whatever ground he needs to cover to make the play. And like I said, he'll actually wrap up a tackle, uh, which tackling last year probably cost us home field advantage, if you want to get right down to it. It was the bad tackling that led to the stress in the secondary and chunk plays over the last half of the year. So that's going to be his biggest impact, I think, immediately. Yeah, I mean... Bad tackling was, you know, what cost them in the regular season. Bad tackling is what cost them against the Jaguars. And, um, yeah, that was the same exact takeaway that I got was just form tackling is really what he does. Um, He's also really good at getting out to the edge and setting the edge, and he never lets anything get outside of him. Um, He's always aware of, you know, reverses, cutbacks, everything like that. If it's a run to the right and he's on the left side, he's still setting that edge on the left side. He's still protecting any back, any back lanes. He's not here for getting burnt by misdirection, which um, I think that was arguably the biggest issue with Sean Davis at strong safety. It's just he just wanted to make a play after play after play, and he was never really in the right position to make those plays, whereas Burnett is always going to be in the right position. Um, we mentioned he's not going to make many huge plays. He's not going to lay a dude out and you know force a fumble and you know stand over the guy or anything like that. He's not going to do that, but he's he's going to get you on the ground for the majority of the time. Um there were some issues where I had with him um like I said in the box is that linebacker role. Um you know kind of stepping up to power running. There were times where you know a center's able to get get into the second level and get his hands on him. Kind of because you know when he's in strong safety, he's kind of running down down into the box whereas you know he's kind of starting flat-footed as a linebacker and um just being able to read and recognize quicker to, because he has to be moving before he's recognizing, whereas safety, he's kind of, he is moving forward while he's recognizing, whereas linebacker, you know, he's so close to the line that he's kind of just recognizing first and the linebacker or the uh, offensive line is able to get their hands on him. 
That's about – that's one of the bigger issues. I mean, he's obviously not going to be, you know, a big force. He's only, you know, 210 pounds or so in the running game, you know. But, yeah, he's he's solid form, solid technicality, um, solid understanding of, you know, where he needs to be, and he never really breaks his gap. So um, it, it's really similar to John Bostic, whereas, you know, it's not splashy. He's not this game-changing player, but he knows what the heck he's doing, and, you know, hopefully – there are enough game-changing Steelers on the roster where um, where they could kind of su- su- supplant and, you know, where they could get built up as far as the instincts and the intuitive nature that, you know, Burnett and Bostic bring and that they could be the game-changers. You know, a guy like Bud Dupree, a guy like Sean Davis could learn from these other players and become game-breakers. Um, I, if there's anything else you want to add, we could probably just go into the, strong, into the safety depth chart. Um, I mean, we talked about it a little bit where – it sounds like Sean Davis is going to move to um, free safety. You know, when you talk about your base set, you know, Burnett has to stay in the box. That's just where he's best at. Um, he hardly ever plays free safety. So that's, it's going to be Davis moving to free. Um, it's his third position, like we said, in, in as many years. So that's an interesting fit. And then you kind of look at the depth and, you know, um, there's Jordan Dangerfield. Um, we both like Jacob Hagan, but, you know, he's probably – the hope is that he's just a special teams guy. And then there's J.J. Wilcox, who, you know, um, Steelers traded for him last year, and, you know, they cut Robert Golden to keep J.J. Wilcox. So um, just overall, how do you really see the safeties breaking, you know, breaking down right now? And uh, just what do you think overall? It's definitely going to be Sean Davis uh, changing positions, right? Yeah, I don't see any other way that that doesn't happen. Uh, And bringing in uh, Ben is still that deal, I think. I, I thought for sure that they would consider moving Sutton to safety, and I'm wondering if keeping Wilcox on the roster is, is uh, any indication that Sutton's going to remain at corner. Uh, and like you say, Hagen, uh, they're going to draft one, so they should be pretty adept, uh, a lot of depth at, at the safety position uh, by the time the draft ends, uh, which is a good problem to have. you got a lot of talented people back there. So it's, there shouldn't be any reason why that position isn't one of strength heading into the uh, preseason. Yeah, and you talked about it with Cameron Sutton, and um, I actually wrote about it, the same article that you can check out on fullpresscoverage.com, whereas um, the Patriots, you know, Steelers fans are obsessed with the Patriots. I'm sure the Steelers have a bit of an obsession with the Patriots as well because that's the team that you have to beat to get to the Super Bowl almost every single year, you know, since 2001. And it's the team that the Steelers have the biggest struggles against. So the, the Patriots last season, with Rex Burkhead, Rob Gronkowski, and James Devlin, okay, you have a running back, a fullback, and a tight end who are just, they're, the, you know, the best at pass catching. You know, they're some of the better pass catchers at their respective position. So what the Patriots can do is they could spread those guys out wide, they could, or they could line them up in the box. You know, they could pick you apart passing or running with the same exact personnel on the field, and that's really hard to defend. You know, when you throw in a guy like Deion Lewis, James White, you know, quick receivers, it's really hard to defend. So what the Steelers have tried to do in the past is implement more dime defense, which is what they want to do is get three defensive linemen, so Hargrave, Tuitt, and Hayward are still on the field so that they can still hold up against the run. But instead you take... um. Vince Williams off of the field, and uh, you take one other guy off of the field, and you have six defensive backs. So you got three up front, six defensive backs, two linebackers. The two linebackers are a pass rusher and then a guy like John Bostic. So and then you have your six defensive backs, which I think would be your two starting corners, Artie Burns and Joe Hayden. Um, you've got Sean Davis and Morgan Burnett, and then you got your slot corner Mike Mitchell or Mike Hilton, and then you have this one extra guy who could kind of be. Whether Burnett is that rover linebacker guy, he would slide into the box, and then you bring in an extra guy. Whether, whether, like you said, it might be Cameron Sutton, it might be a rookie, whatever. He's that sixth defensive back, and he could play deep. He could play in the box, like I said, where Burnett has played at times. He could play in a variety of positions based on the other type of uh, the other personnel that the offense has on the field. So there's still, like, there's a chance that, you know, Davis's role doesn't change all that much and that they maybe add another free safety. Davis is in the box. They're running more dime with Burnett as a, as a linebacker of sorts. So, you know, that you're kind of rotating Vince Williams off the field more. Maybe you're getting Bostic, who, like we said, has injury concerns off of the field more. 
Um, one thing we didn't talk about Burnett is Morgan Burnett has a few injury concerns. So, you know, instead of playing Burnett and Bostic 100% of the snaps, maybe it's, you know, 70 apiece for those guys. And then a guy like Cameron Sutton is getting, you know, 20, 30 snaps. Vince Williams is getting like 60% of the snaps. So you're kind of just rotating like five guys into two positions, essentially. Um, there's a lot of versatility that Morgan Burnett brings, um, especially into the secondary, into the backfield. So um, the way I do see it is I think – I think they'll still draft his safety, which probably isn't good news for a guy, Jacob Hagan. But, um, you know, because Jordan Dangerfield's probably the top special teams guy. Um, J.J. Wilcox, you would assume that they, you know, the reason that they kept him for so long, like you said, was that, you know, they're not moving Sutton to, to safety and that they trust Wilcox. So, you know, he's kind of, he's almost definitely in the mix. I would still probably put Dangerfield over Hagan. So then you have, you know, Burnett and uh, Davis, like we said, you probably draft one more. And it'll be tough for him to get in there. And then you, like I said, I could, you could also argue that maybe you just carry four inside linebackers. You count Burnett as you know a pseudo inside linebacker, and then you still keep five safeties because you would rather be versatile in the back end than in the linebacker group. Um, it's all pretty wide open. Um, I think that if there's anything you want to touch on to what I said, go for it. But um, I don't think they're going to sign anybody else. Whereas when we talked about linebacker, we said maybe there's still a chance they bring someone else in. Um, I don't think they sign anybody else. Do you think they sign anybody else? And just, you know, first off, what are the chances that they draft somebody in the first two rounds? Because like I said, there is still a role for a sixth defensive back in dime defense, which the Steelers are trying to shift towards anyway. So there's still a role that, that could easily be Cameron Sutton. They don't have a need for anybody, you know, early in the draft. And maybe you just take a safety pretty late and see what happens. Or do you still think that, you know, that sixth defensive back is probably in the plans um, there's a chance that Sean Davis doesn't work out and you have to move on from him. There's a chance Burnett is injured and doesn't work out. You have to move on from him. So um, how important is safety in the draft now? Brian? Within the first two rounds, the Steelers are going to pick up a safety. Uh, the good thing is it doesn't have to be a strong safety or a free safety, just a best available safety, and then they'll go from there. And then they'll, they'll grab the uh, inside linebacker probably right after that. But it's a good draft for safety. And they're certainly in a good year to need one. You got cut off at the very beginning. Um, do you just kind of want to repeat the very beginning? Yeah, within the first two, uh, for a position that's being devalued like safety is, uh, it's certainly an important position that they're going to address in the draft. And, I'm almost certain they're going to take one in the first two rounds. Okay. They're going to go either, either safety or inside linebacker or vice versa. But at least now they don't have to draft a strong safety or a free safety. They could just take the best available one there. Right. I agree completely with that whole entire premise. Um, like I said, the versatility of Morgan Burnett doesn't lock you into really anything at all. Um, the longevity of John Bostic doesn't lock you into anything at all in terms of linebacker. Um, those are still probably the biggest needs on the entire roster. Um, it's just, yeah, like, like we both keep saying, you know, at least you have a base starter to where, you know, the top five linebackers are off the board and you're sitting at 28 and you're saying, well, geez, we have to, you know, reach for a guy that we have a low second round grade on in the first round because we don't have a starting linebacker. You know, no, we have John Bostic. That's fine. Oh, geez, we have to reach for, you know, the sixth starting safety because we didn't sign Morgan Burnett. That's not an issue anymore. Um, Burnett signing a three-year deal with some starter money was interesting to me, especially, you know, I mean, Boston got $2 million per. Um, Burnett got about four point five. So it, it appears that in the long term they're going to stick with Burnett over Bostic, but I think that also has to do with – I really see them uh, shuffling Burnett into the box to play some linebacker. Um, I see them trying to get Vince Williams, who's not as fast in coverage, off of the field – Burnett can stay on the field, and he can do a lot of the coverage things that Vince Williams can't. So um, that could be like a platoon, you know, maybe two, three years from now, when you whoever the starting safety is, you know, supplants Morgan Burnett, you kind of just platoon Vince Williams and Morgan Burnett into kind of a, you know, that's a pretty strong linebacker if you took the best skills of both of them. So um, that's kind of how I see it going. Um, is, is there anything else you want to touch on? Because I can. But I pretty much agree. I think it'll still – I could see it going in the first round still, honestly. Um, I think they're open for luxury in the first round. You know, maybe there's a tight end they really like. You know, maybe there's a running back they really like. Um, 
something, even a cornerback, you know, maybe you don't trust Joe Hayden or Artie Burns at this point, you know. So it opens up uh, flexibility for the first round, but I still see linebacker and safety as big needs. And even if not in the first two rounds, still the first three rounds. So um, anything else you want to touch up on uh, on Burnett or, uh, before we close this out? Yeah, I talked to a couple guys today that happen to be uh, big Packer fans, and the one thing that uh, they pointed out was he doesn't do it often, but with his quickness, uh, he's a sneaky blitzer, uh, Burnett is. And I'm wondering if they're not going to try to mix some of that in, into a package with him as well, like they did Hilton last year. As you get a guy that's quick like that, uh, once again, the flexibility. They, they have the flexibility with him to do a multitude of things, and it's probably a better signing than most people think right now. And he may not be there after two years, but because uh, what he's missed 14 games since 2013. But like you said, if they uh, rotate him in and out and keep him fresh, I think that would go a long way. Because you know he, he was in a bad situation in a secondary last year that got pretty beat up. So there was there was a big demand on him to do a lot more than he might otherwise have if everyone had been healthy. Yeah, I agree completely. Flexibility is the key there. Um, you know, one thing that I kind of talked about a little bit last year was um, just getting home with four guys. You know, I mean, everybody has kind of unveiled that that's the key to beating Tom Brady. You know, you have to send four and drop seven and just hope you get home, you know, winning a four on five battle. You know, the way the Steelers are going to do it is, you know, you got your three guys up front and then that fourth guy could be anybody. You know, they're very high on the idea of Dupree being able to drop into coverage, Watt being able to drop into coverage. You know, they're high on the ability of Vince Williams to blitz, Mike Hilton to blitz. Like you said, Morgan Burnett can blitz. So that's just – that's five guys right there that, you know, one of the five is going to come on every single play, but nobody knows what five. So that's pretty important. Um, adding that's definitely big. Uh, the versatility – there's not, we're starting to run out of excuses for Keith Butler. You know, there is a variety of ways that you can use Watt, Dupree, uh, off of the ball. You can use Hargrave on the defensive line in a variety of ways, Tewitt in a variety of ways, Burnett in a variety of ways. Sean Davis, like we said, has played three positions. There's no more excuses for, oh, he doesn't have, you know, the toolbox isn't there, you know. He can run literally any scheme he wants at this point. It's all about, you know, getting them on the same page. This is going to be the the litmus test for Keith Butler because he has enough ver position versatility to really do whatever he pleases. So let, let's see if he can take advantage because if he doesn't, it's a huge problem. So um, that was Brian Harker from last word on profootball.com. Um, check everything he does out over there. Uh, I'm Parker Hurley. Uh, check everything out on fullpresscoverage.com uh, slash Steelers. Uh, we have a podcast center at fullpresscoverage.com. Check us out on iTunes, everything like that. Um, follow me on Twitter, at Parker Hurley. Uh, we'll be back. I think we're going to continue our position-by-position position, uh, series that we are doing. We kind of stopped it to do some free agent signings. I don't think they'll sign really anybody else. Maybe one more special teams guy, maybe a running back. Um, and We will get you a podcast if that happens. But until then, stay tuned for some wide receiver talk coming in the next week or so, um, and we will get back to you guys very soon. So have a great day.